We have to be careful that we, that we start kind of on time. We'll give it two. We'll give it two minutes. Um, yeah. Do you know where it's a, it's a restroom here? Eine Minute. Okay. <laughs> don't don't interrupt him when he's. Ich verstehe, ich habe schon Ist gut, okay, ich sag's ihm weiter. Der Olaf auch, der auch dann, dann läuft dann zusammen. <lacht> Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Klimborg. I'm the director of the Global Commission on the Stability for Cyberspace Initiative. So thank you very much for coming to this either pre- or post-launch lunch session, meaning that you're either hungry or tired, depending upon, but it also means that you're interested enough in our norms and our work to be able to be here today, and we thank you for that. So we would like to draw your attention to our report, Advancing Cyber Stability, copies of which are distributed around the room. We were launched, 27, we were launched in 2017, February, at the Munich Security Conference, and recently presented our report at the Paris Peace Forum uh, under the attendance of the French Foreign Minister Le Drian, the Dutch Foreign Minister Steph Bloch, as well as the Chief of the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, David Ko. And we are now in the process of rolling out report and talking with various stakeholders on how to best receive it. And uh, one of the reasons we are here today, and now our panel is nearly complete. So uh, today our panel here consists of uh, Lata Reddy, who is uh, the co-chair of the GCSC, and uh, in a previous life was the former deputy national security advisor of India and also one of the first cyber coordinators. To our left, we have Christopher Painter, who is former coordinator of cyber issues for the U.S. State Department, also the first person in that role. Uh, recently joined is uh, Wolfgang Kleinwächter. Uh, normally needs no introduction, but just for the sake of it, Professor Emeritus, University of Aarhus, former member of the ICANN board, and of course, uh, part of the original, original structure of, uh, of internet governance from the very beginning. Um, to the left, uh, we have Olaf Kolkman, the Chief Internet Technology Officer of the Internet Society, and Henriette Eisterhusen, Director of Global Policy and Strategy Association for Progressive Communication, but of course, as of recent, the new chair of the MAC. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Lot Reddy, our chair, to start our presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and as Alex said, uh, we welcome you very warmly to this. Uh, uh, the purpose today is to acquaint you with what we have in our report and uh, 
uh, to persuade you that what we've been able to achieve over the last three years has got some lasting value in the debate on cyber stability and uh, will help to make cyberspace more secure. Um, uh, through its work and with this report, we want to address these challenges that cyberspace has thrown up and contribute to international efforts for peace and security by developing proposals for norms and policies to not only enhance international security and stability in cyberspace, but to influence responsible behavior by both state and non-state actors. We brought in knowledge and expertise, perspectives from private sector, civil society, people with government backgrounds such as myself, uh, definitely the technical community and academia which are well represented. And we brought them all into what, what has been traditionally a state-led dialogue of international peace and security in cyberspace. Uh, what we've tried to do is to make it truly multi-stakeholder. Uh, we have 28 commissioners, uh, and of these, we have three chairs. We have four advisors from every region and background. Uh, this was initiated in the Netherlands, uh, first uh, inspired at the London process, as it's called, the Hague uh, Global Conference on Cybersecurity, strongly supported by the Netherlands government. The, initiative came from the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, and along with the East-West Institute, uh, which is in the US, they constitute the GCSC Secretariat. Uh, we are supported, as I said, by a number of uh, partners, not just the government of Netherlands, but also the governments of uh, Singapore and France, as well as Microsoft, the Internet Society, Affiliates, and uh, other sponsors and supporters. We also had a very strong research advisory uh, group. Uh, from the slide which just went off, you would have seen that our representation is pretty good, geographically speaking. Uh, and over the last three years, uh, we've had the opportunity to develop our ideas, engage with a wide range stakeholder group through our public hearings, meetings, consultations, uh, including online uh, public requests for comments, peer reviews, commissioned research, and many other engagements. This report is the culmination of all these discussions, and all our academic research reports are available on the website. Uh, let me just talk about the framework, the uh, diagram which you see up on the screen. Uh, we proposed this framework because every report has to fit into a framework. <laughs> and uh, we thought it was important to define what that framework was. I would particularly draw your attention to three of the items on this framework. Multi-stakeholder engagement, cyber stability principles, the development and implementation of voluntary norms. We have others, we have adherence to international law, confidence building measures, capacity building, and the open promulgation and widespread use of technical standards. But for us, these three which I mentioned, the multi-stakeholder engagement, the cyber stability principles, and the development and implementation of voluntary norms would be the most important. Uh, and we, I would say that it's important to emphasize that we didn't just start from an area where nobody was doing anything about these issues. We know that the UNGG had had several sessions and with great success in the 2013 and 2015 UNGGs. We know the G20, the G7, regional organizations uh, have, have all worked on, on these issues. And there have been uh, issues and norms developed by Microsoft, Carnegie, and ISOC, to name a few outside of the traditional government decision-making bodies. We consider our proposals to be in addition to the existing ecosystem. I'm going to now hand over to Chris Painter for uh, talking about definition and principles. Thank you. There you go. <clears throat> All right, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, 
you know, as Latha said, other uh, efforts have been made to talk about stability uh, and government uh, and other forums. And a number of people have talked about stability of cyberspace. But it was important for us to define what we meant. Uh, what is stability in cyberspace? What do we mean by that? What are we trying to achieve? And, and to, indeed, we tried to build on the, some of those prior definitions that came out of some of those other efforts. As you see, the definition there is stability of cyberspace means everyone can be reasonably confident in their ability to use cyberspace safely and securely. Uh, we don't have that now, by the way, so this is an aspirational definition. Uh, where the availability and integrity, integrity of services and information provided in and through cyberspace are generally assured. Again, we don't have that now, so aspirational. Uh, and where change is managed in relative peace and where tensions are resolved in a non-escalatory manner. So stability often is thought of as an equilibrium, the status quo. That's not what we mean here. We're trying to attain something higher than where we are, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure that once we do that, we, we can handle some of the destabilizing things in cyberspace, some of the, the attacks and other issues, in a way that's non-escalatory. And I think that's very important that goes to the availability and integrity of information. So that underlies all of our work. And go to the, okay, so the next slide then is, uh, we have four principles. So we have a definition, we have principles, and you'll hear about the other elements in the report in a second. These four principles, I think, really are overarching. One is responsibility, uh, that everyone is responsible for ensuring the stability of cyberspace. And that really reaffirms the idea this is a multi-stakeholder uh, endeavor and a multi-stakeholder approach, that we need to hear from everyone, that everyone, not just states, but everyone has a stake in this. The second is restraint, um, that you know, states and non-state actors, this is an important distinction in our report, is not just state actors, we deal with non-state actors as well, uh, you know, have an obligation to refrain from taking harmful actions. And this is actually grounded in the UN Group of Governmental Experts report from 2015 that talks about this very thing, about uh, uh, norms of restraint, if you will. Uh, the third is a requirement to act, that affirmative action by all stakeholders and cooperative steps to reduce the likelihood of adversary escalating tensions uh, are to reduce the threats to stability. So it's not just good enough for you to sit on your hands and not do bad things, you have an affirmative duty to actually help do good things. And finally, uh, respect for human rights, which is, not, I say finally, but that certainly isn't finally in terms of the list. It is an undergirding principle for everything else we do. Uh, and it's, it's reflective of an understanding of not just that human rights are very important, but also that as we seek to do stability, as we seek to impose measures and have measures and get agreements on stability, um, that at the same time we want to make sure we are not unduly infringing human rights. We're not having an effect on human rights that is either unintended or if intended is a bad one. Uh, and we make sure we're keeping that at top of mind as we look at these issues. Yeah, so next, please, uh, we go to Olaf. So yeah, um, this is a little bit, uh, I, I'm gonna address some of the norms. And what you see back is that the, the, these, these principles that, that we just talked about, you can find back in the, the ways that we, we phrased the, the, the norms. Um, for instance, the responsibilities for everyone, um, you will often find the norms starting with state and non-state actors. Um, and that is a reflection of that uh, fact that there is a responsibility for multiple actors. So we, uh, we have a number of norms, um, and um, I'm going to talk about four of them. The first norm that we came out with um, is the, the norm uh, to protect the public core. State and non-state actors should neither conduct or normally allow activity that intentionally and substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet, and therefore the stability of cyberspace. So, when you read this, you might wonder what that public core is. Um, we haven't given a full definition of the public core, but it's clearly that it, it incorporates the naming, the routing, and the cryptography methods that create the global connectivity that we rely on. It's the systems, it's the software, and it's the logical constructs, but it's also the hardware that make up a global network of networks and give us the general connectivity. Second norm, call to protect the, electrical infra, uh, the electoral infrastructure. Uh, we found it, was, it is very important to call out that uh, electoral, electoral infrastructure is an important component of, uh, of keeping states 
keeping civilizations, keeping cyberspace as a whole uh, uh, stable. Um, I can read this out. State and non-state actors must not pursue, support, or allow cyber operations intended to disrupt the technical infrastructure essential to elections, referenda, or placibities. Pl I, I can never exp uh, uh, pronounce that word, but that's, you know, being a Dutch. Who um, anyway, the, the, this, it's important that we focus on the technology with this norm. Uh, we focus on the infrastructure uh, that allows us to conduct uh, uh, elections in a, in a proper way. The rest of the norms are a little bit more back to cyber infrastructure and a little bit more generic. Um, there are two norms now that sort of uh, uh, hook together. The norm to avoid tampering and norms against commandeering of ICT devices into botnets. The first norm is really about su supply chain, making sure that when products are uh, uh, produced that within the supply chain and within the, the, the delivery of these goods, uh, nobody tempers with these things. Because tempering of these products and services will severely un undermine trust and trustworthiness in, in cyberspace. So state and non-state actors should not tamper with products and services in development and production or allow them to be tampered with. If doing so, may substantially impair the stability of cyberspace. I should, by the way, note that this, uh, this norm and also the, the, the norm on the public, uh, uh, the public core have some proportionality in it. It doesn't completely forbid uh, tempering, uh, because in some cases, if uh, really proportional uh, and really targeted, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tool that might be used by states to, uh, uh, to do their business. Fourth one is norm against commandeering of ICT devices into botnets. Uh, state and non-state actors should not commandeer the general public's ICT resources for use as botnets or similar purposes. The idea around this norm is that uh, uh, with all the devices that are in the general public's you know, use in, in, in SMEs but also at people's home, if they are turned into belligerent uh, 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 devices, um, um, uh, innocent uh, uh, actors become you know, belligerent actors. Uh, unknowingly, and that would be uh, uh, that would be pretty bad. So this is basically saying, uh, don't use uh, a big IoT networks to uh, in attacks. Uh, make sure that you uh, 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 stay away uh, from from the general public with that. Um, and with that, this goes uh, to, I think to Ott Henriette, right? Thank you. Um, more norms. <laughs> um, Thanks, and I just, I mean, I'll start by just also uh, emphasizing um, the remarks that, that Chris made about human rights. And I think what is very innovative about the Commission's report is that we mentioned that by individual users feeling that they can trust that their rights are respected on the internet, that in itself generates um, a climate of cyber secure, security and stability. So it's both um, not impacting negatively on rights when engaging in securing cyberspace, but also recognizing that respect for rights, respect for, for the security of communications and information contributes to a secure environment. The fifth norm is the norm on um, for states to create a vulnerability equity process. Um, states should create procedurally transparent frameworks to assess whether and when to disclose not publicly known vulnerabilities or flaws they are aware of in information systems and technologies. The default presumption should be in favor of disclosure. This norm is necessary because there are times when states have in fact not disclosed such vulnerabilities because they felt they could potentially exploit that um, for some form of action which they deemed they could justify um, based on, on securing cyberspace. And so this norm is about the disclosure process. It gives some guideline on, on, on how the assessment can be made and it advocates for a transparent process. And also then when states do disclose such vulnerabilities, that it's done in a responsible way that might, you know, would not unduly negatively impact on 
on private sector actors um, and their, their businesses, for example. The sixth norm is the norm to reduce and mitigate significant vulnerabilities. So it's linked to the, the vulnerabilities, um, um, the, the procedure, the, the previous norm, which is having the vulnerabilities equities process. And this norm is addressing both, uh, both um, it's actually producing many non-state actors, developers and producers of products and services on which the stability of cyberspace depends should prioritize security and stability. And they should take reasonable steps to ensure that their products and services are free from significant vulnerabilities. And if they know of such vulnerabilities, take me uh, measures to, to mitigate them. Um, all actors have a duty to share information on vulnerabilities in order to help prevent or mitigate malicious cyber activity. Um, the seventh norm is the norm on basic cyber hygiene as a foundational defense. This norm comes from the context, I mean, the example that, that, that I always think of is the, the National Health Service in in, in the United Kingdom. It's, it's a norm that is saying that states should take measures, appropriate measures, including, if it seems appropriate, laws and regulation to ensure basic cyber hygiene. This would involve public institutions, private sector institutions, taking measures to ensure that their systems, that their software, that their applications are, are up to date, that security patches are installed, that, that, there's, that there's good cyber hygiene, um, antivirus, data backup systems. Um, and this, is a, this norm actually builds on some decisions that have already been made at the Europe level. Um, and, it's, it's, and it's in the spirit, I think, as, uh, as we heard earlier, that one of the principles um, is responsibility. And as, as was said, that, that all institutions, all users, need to take responsible actions to help secure cyberspace. And then the final norm is the norm against offensive cyber operations by non-state actors. Um, I'll read it. It's short. Non-state actors should not engage in offensive cyber operations and state actors should prevent such activities and respond if they occur. So this addresses the reality of states having non-state actors who might be behaving as proxies, as proxies, or also either either tolerating or actively encouraging um, other uh, non-state actors to engage in offensive cyber operations. And if states permit such action, they may therefore be held responsible under interna international law. And I think that's something else about our norms, and it's in our principles, that adherence to international law is a very important consideration for us. We don't see our norms as existing outside of international law. In fact, we, we believe that international law, including international human rights law, needs to be considered. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, then next, we have uh, the affirmations. Uh, so our work has been endorsed by a number of actors. Here, Lata. We are actually quite delighted with uh, the, the positive mentions and affirmations we've got for our work. And uh, most recently, yesterday, we were very encouraged by the fact that Chancellor Angela Merkel herself referred to the public core of the uh, internet as being something very essential that needs to be uh, protected. And uh, that was, as you heard, one of our norms. In fact, it was the first norm we put out. Um, the Paris call for trust and security has referred to five of our norms. This was in 2018. And uh, that has been endorsed now by well over a 1,000 uh, signatories, including uh, governments, including the private sector, including individuals and organizations. And the norm, to, again, on the public core of the internet, it is, that norm has been embedded into EU policy and law through its Cybersecurity Act, which also extends the mandate of ENISA to include the protection of the public core of the internet. The Cybersecurity Tech Accord has welcomed our norm package and offered comments on enhancing stability in cyberspace. 
the UNSG High-Level Panel on Digital Cooperation report, which UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres referred to yesterday, highlights the work of the Global Commission, and we are specifically mentioned in the High-Level uh, Panel report. These are just a few examples of the way in which our work on norms has achieved success as we look to build on this further through advocating for norm implementation and compliance in various fora, exactly like we're doing today. And we're hoping not just to present our work to you, but to have an active interaction with you so that you can help us determine the best way forward. I'd now like to hand over to Wolfgang, uh, to, who is going to speak to us about the recommendations of yes. our report. Uh, Lata, thank you very much. And what Lata has just said is very important because our aim of the very early moment was to produce a document which will not disappear in the libraries of the forgotten reports. And the libraries are full. That's why we try to be as realistic as possible and to uh, analyze very carefully you know, the concrete situation we are in. And that's why we were very pleased to see that yesterday in uh, the big keynote speech by Chancellor Merkel, uh, the public core norm played an important role. And Madame Merkel was very clear that they say, you know, with all the differences we have in the world, uh, we should be united in uh, some basic issues. And to protect the public core of the internet is one uh, of these elements where probably we can agree even among, um, uh, you know, other borders and differences. Uh, and uh, in so far also our recommendations, we have six recommendations, you know, how to move forward, uh, oriented on the, you know, what's going on in the world and where we can make a contribution. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to text there, there is no need to read the recommendations, you know, I would try to translate it into very simple language. And the first recommendation just says, you have to do something. So we are in a situation where we cannot be silent anymore or lean back and do nothing. So we have to do something. The second uh, recommendation is if somebody violates norms, he has to face consequences. I think this is one of the, of the issues <laughs> in, in many areas in the cyberspace that you can do things without any consequences. And this is bad. So that means we have to uh, 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 have a mechanism that wrongdoers face consequences. Um, recommendation three is we need more capacity that people understand the issue. And not only the men in the street, so it goes to the leaders of corporations and that goes to the leaders of, uh, of, of, of governments, of ministries. So uh, very often, you know, in many governments, you have just one or two persons in one ministry who understands how the DNS is working, you know, how IP address systems are working. So we have a low level of capacity, but everybody deals with this issue. And we have to close this capacity uh, gap. And uh, that's why we are also pleased that the open-ended working group in New York has capacity building as one of its uh, uh, agenda points next to confidence building and norm building. So um, that means capacity building is an important uh, point. Uh, the fourth recommendation is, you know, we have to have uh, what we call a norm watch. So that means we have established norms and then we have to see, you know, how the norms are implemented. So, and, 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 and this is also a challenge how to organize this. The, the recommendation reads here, state and non-state actors should collect, share, review and publish information on norms, violations and the impact of such activities. We have to know what's going on. So that means we cannot uh, accept the situation where this is hide or where is this uh, forgotten. So it has to be public. We need more transparency in the violation of norms so that we can create a critical mass uh, of uh, uh, stakeholders and actors to um, um, deal with this norm violations. And uh, this is linked to the uh, recommendation on consequences. And uh, then we have two other norms, you know, which uh, 
uh, you know, looking into the future. So this cannot be done by a world government of the internet. There will be never a world government of the internet. So it's a decentralized system. The internet itself is a decentralized system. And also the, the governance of the internet will be a decentralized system where you have to build individual mechanisms around the issues, uh, to have mechanisms where needed. And in so far, we have introduced this concept of the communities of interest. That means if there's an issue where the community feels there is a need to do something, then you know they should, uh, in a bottom-up and open and transparent way, build such community and interests which would help to ensure the stability of cyberspace. And the final recommendation is that we need something like a standing multi-stakeholder engagement mechanism to address those issues. You know, this is very close related to the ideas which were expressed in the high-level uh, uh, report of the uh, UN uh, under Antonio Guterres. As you know, two members of our commission were all the members of the high-level panel, Marina and Vincerf. And so uh, we are looking forward to what the discussion will produce uh, on, on the high-level uh, panel report. You have seen yesterday morning there was a three-hour discussion in the plenary. Uh, and, and, and my impression from this is it uh, moves towards an IGF plus taking uh, probably on board some other ideas from the two other mechanisms. But this mechanism has to be carefully drafted because uh, the internet as such is a layered system and in so far all the mechanisms we have to build you know, have to take into consideration that there is no space for one size fits all. You have to draft and design a mechanism in a very careful way that it really meets the needs which are coming up you know, from, from certain issues. Uh, but there is a need, and uh, uh, I've just got the, 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 the email from um, uh, Bertrand, because in parallel he presents his report on the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, and he has made a big survey, and he came with two interesting figures. So while 95% of the um, people who have participated in the survey said, you know, uh, this will be an issue for the next three years, a top priority issue for policymakers, and only 15% uh, uh, replied uh, that the existing institutions and mechanisms already sufficient enough. That means here we have a gap, but it makes no sense to fill the gap with a new bureaucracy. So that means we have to move forward in a very intelligent, creative way uh, so that uh, we can meet the needs by uh, keeping the stability and not okay. uh, uh, creating uh, um, okay. a, a big new, new powerhouse. This won't work. So this is open for discussion. We are looking forward, and we hope that our recommendations will go into the processes. Here we have a number of milestones. Over the next week, we have the intersessional meeting in New York, where uh, we hope to produce additional input into the two uh, groups on uh, the open-ended working group and the group of government experts. We have the Munich Security Conference, which is in February, and we have the process which has started just now to prepare a document for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This is October 24, 2020. And in the bigger run, we have the uh, 25 uh, visits plus 20. Uh, this is plus 20 conference, and in the year 2030, we have the, uh, the, the, the uh, sustainable development goals. So the next decade will be full of various activities. Uh, you know, Max is here, so we have also started a discussion process on the next generation internet governance, where we want to uh, have promote more a holistic view, so that security issues are seen in the context of economic developments, of human rights, uh, what uh, uh, Chris also has mentioned, and uh, latest techno technological developments like AI. So that means uh, a new decade is ahead of us and a lot of things has to be done. Thank you. So you've all heard about the uh, principles, the norms, the recommendations. Uh, the, uh, the term of our commission has come to an end, but I don't see this as an end. I see this as a beginning of how are we going to implement everything we've talked about, of what are the ways we're going to engage with other communities and other processes. And we will continue as GCSC members uh, to engage with people and groups 
Uh, you've already heard about the upcoming meetings in New York where we will be engaging further. And uh, now we would welcome questions and we would welcome an opportunity to interact with all of you and to hear your suggestions and requests for clarifications. I'll just pass this on to Alex to moderate this. Yes, thank you very much for that. So you have heard some of the highlights of a report, but this is a unique opportunity to engage with the authors on some issues that you might not have felt were covered or indeed uh, background material on our history and processes and outlook. So um, I see one gentleman over in the front, uh, please indicate uh, second gentleman over here, please indicate your uh, name and affiliation uh, for the record. Thank you. My name is Max Senges. Um, good afternoon. I work uh, for Google on Internet Governance Issues. Uh, thank you very much for this really, really um, useful and helpful work. I have um, three questions. One, um, thanks, Henriette. You talked about the cyber hygiene. That um, is a very interesting concept. If, I, um, if you allow, it's not very well defined what it is indeed. I've, uh, I've had, I have an idea, but I'd love to understand how we can rally around it and provide better, better hygiene. Um, secondly, Wolfgang, you have mentioned um, that violations um, should have consequences. Now, um, we're all aware that it's very difficult to actually uh, be sure who did what and who the actors are and um, you know how how are the the violations then um, uh, what consequences do you have in mind and uh, the, the last one is more a comment you you do talk about uh, in the recommendations you talk about uh, measurement and uh, monitoring and um, Tim Berners-Lee has uh, very successfully launched the contract for the web. I think it includes a number of principles that are um, uh, compatible and in line with um, uh, what you're proposing. And I heard that 806 organizations have uh, signed up to, I think that means retweeted, the uh, launch of the, the contract for the web, which uh, seems to indicate a significant interest and momentum behind it. Um, so far, the contract has defined mostly the principles to start with, but there is a second part that is actually the, the part where the rubber hits the road, where you're measuring and monitoring whether those principles have been implemented. Maybe the commission can consider to jump on that momentum and um, include measurements of the cyber stability um, uh, norms in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for those, uh, those very interesting questions. So on cyber hygiene, I'm probably going to turn to Olaf first. And for some comments, uh, just as a backgrounder, of course, we're in Germany, and Germany has something called the IT Grundschutz. So there, it's, I think, very often easy to imagine this as basic protective measures. But um, perhaps all of you would like to share some thoughts, and then I'll go to uh, Chris for violations and perhaps Wolfgang for monitoring. Yeah, uh, cyber hygiene not being clearly defined, I think that's a feature rather than a bug. Um, because obviously when it comes to cyber hygiene, if you really drill down to it, it might come down to very specific technical standards. Um, and those are usually changing um, in an agile environment as, as uh, the c cyber environment is, the internet and all the digital services that we have around us. Um, but taking that up a somewhat higher level uh, uh, thought, it is really about things like non-default passwords. It's about things that we sort of, when we spend five minutes talking to each other, we can come up with a list of the types of things that we actually should not be doing any longer. And where there's fairly general consensus, I would say, in the industry, that uh, uh, some things are really bad habits. Um, as I said, you know, if, if you look at, at the various uh, ways that people talk about IoT and the IoT frameworks that are coming up and the principles of IoT devices, I think that there's a fairly uh, a good set of minimum baseline about cyber, cyber, cyber hygiene. It's about uh, being able to uh, report vulnerabilities. It's about being able to do firmware upgrades. It's about non-default passwords. And those things, although we don't explicitly mention those type of things in the report because I think that is a follow-up conversation. It is the case that at some point we should say if, an, if a producer of goods doesn't comply to this basic hy uh, hygiene, then we don't want this crap into our markets. 
Can I, I, can I just add to that? I mean, we use the term cyber hygiene because it's actually being used in the context of Europe, the European Telecommunications Standards Institute. Um, Etsy uses the term. But many people in this community would use terms like digital security or, or digital safety. So it's, it's not, it's, it's in fact, there's a preoccupation in this community for building capacity in more secure and safe practice for users to protect their own rights, but also to contribute to a more systemically safe environment. So we use that term cyber hygiene specifically because we, 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 it had been used in a similar context. But we could, as Olaf said, it's a, it's a bug, not a feature. Okay. Uh, Chris? Uh, Sorry, uh, it's a feature, not a uh, although, although, just to be a little more uh, on the edge about this recommendation, I think it also evinces a, a, uh, a feeling of frustration that we've talked about cyber hygiene for a long time and we're not getting anywhere. So if you look at the recommendation and you look at the explanatory text, it even talks about taking uh, more legislative or other action to make sure we're making progress because it hasn't worked. All, all of our efforts have only made so much progress. So that one of our commissioners, Jane Hall Lute, feels very strongly about this, so just channeling her a little bit. Uh, the, uh, on the, I'm going to move on to the other issue. Just yeah, no, I, I wanted to say this. The, it, 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 it relates to that previous norm. The first norm says um, uh, non-state actors essentially should do their, you know, their 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 thing for minimal standards, and then this norm, the cyber hygiene norm, says basically if if that doesn't work, then state actors have instruments. Right. To well, let's move on so, to so, violations. So on, on so, the yeah. on the, you know, I, I look at this in two concepts. I think the commission looks at this in two concepts. You could have all the rules in the world. You could have all the norms in the world. You could have all the following international law in the world. But if there is no accountability or consequences for people who do bad actions, they become words on paper. They become the shelfware that, that, uh, that uh, uh, Wolfgang was talking about. And that's, that's in itself a destabilizing thing because it emboldens bad actors to act worse, right? And I think we've seen a lot of that over the last couple of years. So what we say here is there's two portions of this. One's accountability, calling out violations. We talk about that in one place. The other is making sure there are consequences for those bad actions. And there could be a range of different consequences, economic and others. We, I think, both countries and just as a society, we've been terrible at actually imposing those consequences in a way that makes sense. And of course, you don't want to do it in an escalatory way. You don't want the consequences themselves to call more, cause more instability. So you have to make sure uh, you do that in the correct way. I don't think this is impossible. I think attribution is not as much of a challenge as people think it is. We talked about that in the commission too, but we thought this was an essential part of stability. And just one thing that I'll, I'll just mention on top of this, and it dovetails with that, is our other one of our other recommendations talks about capacity building. And indeed, that underlies a lot of these things to get other people in the game. Uh, you know, another group that's that's here is the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, and we mentioned that in the report as one of the platforms to pull together capacity building around the world, and that's an important part to it. Uh, a couple of final thoughts, measuring and monitoring of Wolfgang, or was that included? No? OK, good, great. So uh, gentleman over here, please. And then the gentleman in the back is next. Thank you. Uh, hello, good afternoon. I'm Savio from, the, from Brazil. I'm here by the, the youth program of the Brazilian Internet Steering Group. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask you about cooperation with other institutions. Like, uh, I've seen that it seems that it's not a real cooperation, uh, a, a real cooperation between the institutions. Like, I see I can doing some taking some actions, uh, having some type of some type of troubles. Uh, I see IETF have, having some other actions, but don't talk with ICANN's actions, and I see you having some problems, uh, making some recommendations and regulations, and I can see, I can't see these three institutions uh, talking between to solve the same problem. We are all looking to the same problem. We can, we are concerned with it, but it's not like a collaboration. It's each one taking you your own way, and don't look like one good action plan, like everyone don't doing your own job and carrying some different things, but not organized, each one with one different part of the, of the problem. Well, well, thank you very much for that. That goes to the heart of why the commission was set up. Um, indeed, this silofication of all these issues is a major problem, but we don't think everybody should be doing necessarily the exact same thing. So it's an issue of coherence between 
various silos, not convergence of all silos together. Uh, would someone in the commission like to, to pick that yeah, up? Yeah, also, I, I, I don't want to be sounding overly defensive, but I do think those, uh, con concretely the, the, the institutions that you mentioned, all have their individual role. Um, and uh, within that role, take their responsibility. I can, in the policy making uh, around the DNS, um, and if we take the DNS issue, for instance, uh, uh, the ITF in the protocol development of the DNS. And then there is a whole set of implementers and actors that implement these policies or implement the technologies that then uh, give cause to policy questions, as we've seen with uh, DOH currently. And what I think is important is that we realize, and I think that this part of the, what, what Wolfgang was expressing, is that there is no center to the internet, that there is no central security tsar that can say, this is the way that it's going to be, but that you have all these uh, places where these processes are taking place. And similarly, we have places where we meet each other, where there is norm coherence, where the norm entrepreneurs, as one of the researchers uh, in this space calls it, come together where views are exchanged and the new um, sort of uh, far sites are, are being set out. Uh, thank you. So we have a gentleman in the back. How many other questions do we have? I ask each gentleman over here then after that and lady over here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hans Klein. I'm from Georgia Tech. So I congratulate the commissioners for their excellent work. I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, the norms you have produced are norms in the abstract, derived from good principles, ethics, of ethics and justice, and so on. But in moving towards adoption and diffusion of these norms, there will be other factors that enter the picture because this affects actors, including state actors. It affects interests. So I'm, I'm curious to hear more about how uh, uh, how power and interest might enter the picture going forward or even to date, uh, how w did state power or power or, or industry interests affect your process here? Either uh, were there some norms that were considered but excluded? Were there some norms that encountered opposition but that were included? Were there some norms that were actively promoted that you took into consideration and did include them? And particularly as you go forward into, into more operational policy making venues, how do you see the interplay between abstract principles and interests? Uh, thank you very much. That's a, like a sausage making question. How did we do balance out the various interests in our commission? It's a great question. We're going to go to two more questions as well. Take them together because we have uh, 15 minutes left. So I saw a gentleman in the back and I saw a lady in the, in the row before. I'm going to stand up since I'm in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bay. I'm senior expert at NATO Stratcom COE. Um, I specifically study uh, manipulation service providers. Uh, just here in Berlin, there's a company that turn over a million euro and 10 employees, and the only thing they do is manipulate social media companies. Social media companies, to some extent, are complicit because they allow these companies to place ads on their services to market their services. So when it comes to non-state actors, I was just wondering, did you think about these kind of non-state actors, commercial entities who are you know, active in the open and actively manipulating um, aspects of the digital domain? It would be interesting to hear. And if you didn't think about it, what's your initial reflection? Just Thank for you. clarification, do you mean non-state actors that are working um, for their own political benefit, i.e. ideological groups? Or do you mean criminals? Or do you mean contractors for government? No, so these are companies that take orders from, any, from anyone. So there is at least in Europe about 70 commercial companies who sell social media manipulation. Okay. Around the world, hundreds. And, uh, um, so, so these, and they are for hire by states for hire. or Got whoever. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Then there was uh, another question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good idea to stand up. My name is Lisa Vermeer. I'm a digital policy advisor at the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. Um, I have, thank you so much for drafting these norms. They're, they're, they're excellent, I think, especially the norm on the public core is very inspirational. I also really was happy to read all the recommendations that you formulated in the final report. And I wanted to ask a question about recommendation five. It's about um, um, to have a correct. No, recommendation four, like collect, share, review, and public information on norm violations and the impact of such activities. I could see an important role for civil society and nonprofit organizations in this field, and I wanted to ask you what role you see for both civil society issue organizations and also for nonprofit technical um, 
uh, organizations to monitor and report and maybe work on mechanisms on these norms and then maybe zooming in a bit on the public core norm because it's, that has a very technical angle but possible very political or uh, policy um, impact on civil society organizations. And um, do you see any mechanisms now in other areas that had a good impact and a real impact? Um, so thank you so much on reflecting on the real implementation of these norms. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the three questions for the commissioners to all the, uh, were how the special interests um, play a role or how did we manage to balance our different interests within our commission, the roles of non-state actors as well as recommendation for norm violations, monitoring and relevance for the public court. Chris, I can see you're chomping well, at the only bit, because so. I have to leave a little early, I'm sorry. I have another meeting that I'm going to, but uh, the GFC meeting. Uh, but what I wanted to say is on the first question, you know, interestingly, you know, having come from government, that's the kind of negotiations you have all the time. You have different interests and we have to balance them. But, uh, and it's always harder when you have more stakeholders in the room. However, I think we made real progress. For instance, even though we had private sector representatives in the room, we have a norm that talks about the private sector taking more care, you know, doing, making sure they release products that are as free as possible of vulnerabilities. That's not something the private sector would necessarily sign up to right away. So getting to that point, I think, was really important. Uh, on the other hand, we also are sensible in terms of how we're going to engage governments and other stakeholders in this. So when we look at some of the other norms, like the norm, the public core norm, for example, or the vulnerability equities norm, the public core norm is not binary. It's not you can't do anything with respect to the public core. It understands that states for law enforcement or other purposes are going to do some things, but they can't disrupt the public norm core in a way that is going to cause problems for everyone. So we balance those various interests because we understand that we can't just be talking at this level where no one will ever take these things up. We have to be able to engage with these communities to have them actually uh, approve these. And we did, I think, take a very balanced approach given, given uh, our both regional and, and uh, background representation and made compromises, which I think really helped. Um, just on the, on the last point, uh, look, I do think civil society, and others can talk about this, uh, civil society, I think, has a key role in that accountability. You know, we've seen governments do some joint attribution. That's been good. But we haven't seen a lot really describing what kinds of activity we're seeing, measuring it, having metrics, as someone else mentioned, calling out behavior, and the impact it actually has on communities that may not be initially apparent. I think that's a really important recommendation. I think there's absolutely a role for civil society going forward. Uh, Chris, before you go, since you have to run, how about the second question, which is on the non-state actors and effectively if we felt our norms covered them sufficiently? Uh, look, I, I think we, we, we do uh, deal with non-state actors. I, I think we were you know, careful in terms of like our election norm, don't attack the election uh, infrastructure. Uh, that's the infrastructure. We didn't deal with influence operations or other issues. We're not trying to cover everything in this, this set of recommendations. And indeed, this goes to an earlier question. We are trying to add value in, in an area that we think has been underserved, stability. There's been lots of other reports, lots of other recommendations, other things. There's a lot of activity around disinformation now. That's really important. There's many different strands of that. We weren't trying to deal with that head on, but I think some of our recommendations do, uh, do apply to that. So just also to add on to that, concepts like international law, concepts like effective control do of course apply and are reinforced in our report and they are particularly relevant for the uh, second question. Uh, Henriette? Um, yes, I actually just pick up with that, that question. I think that um, you know, our norms are not intended to be comprehensive. So I mean, we do have a, a norm against offensive actions by non-state actors. And I think if one, you know, developing that norm to address the specific scenario you're talking about, um, social media manipulation, um, is something that could easily be done. That wasn't quite our mandate. We were focusing on, on um, security and, and um, attacks against infrastructure. Just to respond to Hans um, and then to Lisa. Hans, I think we... Definitely no uh, string pulling in the back. Um, I think it was a very honest process, but it is also a process based on compromise because we are a multi-stakeholder commission and we have different concerns. I mean, the norm on cyber hygiene, for example, was a very debated norm, but we worked through the differences that we had in, in perspective on that and we reached compromise. I think what I would say as a civil society person, which for me characterized the, the work of the commission, is that it, it came from a very pragmatic place. The commission started from the place that cyber threats are real, cyber attacks 
attacks are real. Bad state behavior is real. Bad non-state behavior is real. And so it's not, we didn't have these sort of aspirational, you know, let's have a peaceful cyberspace. It wasn't that kind of commission. It was a commission that was trying to engage reality, the status quo, and within that framework, um, come up with, with, with norms that can advocate for, for more responsible behavior and for repercussions. And I think that, Lisa, the, the role of civil society in, you know, in the whole development of norms is absolutely critical, I think, and I'm putting my civil society hat on here. I think we're in a situation at the moment where many of us would be quite, quite wary of having an international cybersecurity treaty because we would be concerned that such a treaty uh, contains restrictions for restrictions on fundamental freedoms. Um, that, but that doesn't mean we don't need norms. And I think we've already seen civil society, I mean, how many of you remember necessary and proportionate? The, the civil society developed norms on, on surveillance, good practice for, for surveillance. Um, and I think civil society's engagement both in monitoring um, looking at frameworks for how norm compliance can be monitored, and it also developing new norms and being part of this conversation of, of using norms as a tool, I think is absolutely, otherwise this work just won't be worth anything. Thank you. Uh, Olaf, and then... Yeah, and, and, and just on the, on this, on, on the logic about this, uh, of, the, of the inclusion of the stakeholders in the norm development, is because the next steps need to be implemented as well. If we talk about cyber hygiene, what does that mean, for instance? There is always a next step. And um, um, there are, have been processes, for instance, in Canada and in France where uh, the local community came together, uh, government, uh, 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 companies, technical community, and the civil society to look at what are our approaches to cyber hygiene for IoT. Um, and I think that is the right way to do it because in the end, um, these things need to be implemented at regional, local level in ways that are carried by everybody in society. And that means that there is always a civil society aspect to these type of things, and specifically monitoring in implementations on, on the ill effects, for instance. It's clearly a civil society uh, 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 type of, of, of watchdog function. Thank you, Olaf. Wolfgang? Yeah, uh, uh, Olaf has mentioned, or has used the language, the next step. You know, I remember a meeting, an ICANN meeting in San Francisco 10 years ago when Bill Clinton, under his administration, ICANN was established, uh, argued he sees internet governance as a process of stumbling forward. So stumbling forward is a very good description of what this process is. You're always looking for the next stumbling step, and then you move in a still a rather uncharted or the unknown territory. I think we have not yet fully understood all the consequences of cyberspace or the interdependence. You know, in so far, it was good that the UN panel, you know, uh, used as a title for the report the age of interdependence. So uh, we have all kinds of, 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 of interdependence we have not yet fully understood. And in so far, I think our approach to the it norms was also we offer not the norms as a package but uh, as like a buffet and each of the norms can be uh, developed in a different way and can produce uh, different forms of outcome, multi-stakeholder arrangements, intergovernmental treaties, other mixed documents or something like that. I remember that, and, and Hans Lein will remember that, when Kofi Annan gave an address in the World Summit Information uh, Society uh, meeting, he uh, lamented that the internet is an innovation in technology, but we have no innovation in policy making. We still do policy making uh, with the instruments of the 20th century, but we are confronted, you know, with issues of the 21st century. It means we have to innovate uh, the political processes. And in so far, you know, our recommendations are also forward-looking and say, okay, you know, if there is a need, create something which, you know, uh, meets the challenges of this very specific issue. And uh, creativity 
on the part of the policymakers is an important challenge for the, for the next decade. And part of this is also, you know, the interaction among the various groups. And in so far, you know, your question was very, very interesting because indeed, uh, if you look around, everybody is sitting in their silo. And if you go to one silo, for instance, you know, I was a member of the board of ICANN. ICANN is a silo in itself, but within ICANN, you have a number of other silos. So you have the supporting organizations, the advisory committees, and even in the GNSO, one supporting organizations. You have another silo, which are the contracted parties and the non-contracted parties and the various constituencies. The only way out from this broad diversity and growing complexity is to have a better flow of communication, enhanced communication, and a certain form of liaisons. And in so far, I come back to uh, what we have discussed also a little bit earlier with the future of the IGF and the IGF Plus. Here there is, is, is one proposal on a so-called cooperation accelerator. And I think this is the way forward that you enhance the, 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 the mechanisms which link the various bodies together without interfering into internal affairs of their bodies. So you respect the identity of the group which managed a special issue, but uh, you learn from that and you, you get uh, inspiration from that and you do your decisions in the light of what is doing elsewhere. So that you, you keep the internet as a, a global phenomenon, uh, interoper <laughs> interoper the interoperability, uh, and, and, and what Madame Merkel and Guterres said yesterday, one, one world, one net, one vision. So the vision is to keep us together. The risk is indeed, and we should not be naive, that we move towards a fragmentation of the internet, that probably we have you know, a BRICS internet and the YANA internet or something like that. There is a risk on the table and we should be aware, but we should avoid this and we should uh, enhance our cooperation and enhanced cooperation starts with enhanced communication. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you like to give us the microphone, Wolfgang? Thank you. And to Thank Lato. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you all very much. We're really out of time. But I just want to say, as uh, I think Chris said in initially, this is aspirational. A lot of what we're saying, whether it's our recommendations, whether it's our principles, is aspirational. And what we want to do is to say what should be done. The norms also say what should be done, what should not be done. And we are hoping that this is only the beginning it's not an end, and it also opens up the way for us to think of ways forward. And I think we've done what we set out to do, which is to make everybody talk, comment, say how, why, when, where. And uh, we look forward to being with all of you on this journey as we take our work way forward. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thank you.